there. I can block the door. There we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Authored Content. This is episode 27. And uh, with me, as always, I have my two co-hosts, James Williamson and hey, Ray Vigilobos. Very good. You're getting better at that name, man. It always <laughs> yeah. amazes me that you actually know what show number we're still on. Uh, I, I have, to check like, I have no time. idea. I have to check every single time. <laughs> yeah, what number are we on now? I wasn't listening. 27. If you weren't listening. That's very nice. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to change because I have to change before we start. So Wait, are you gonna go? You're gonna ch- go change clothes? It's weird. He's gonna do something, something odd. Hmm. That's just really weird. <laughs> oh, I hope we don't see some white Norwegian skin here. Oh, okay, that's good. Just the... <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with white Norwegian skin. What the heck? There, now you can't see me, right? I'm in this. <laughs> yeah, you're in camo. <laughs> what is that? Uh, my uh, mother-in-law went to Alaska, and all she brought me was a camo T-shirt. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and of course, like in Canada, I don't know, maybe I don't know. No, you're right. Maybe so, in the woods, you would sort of like blend in a little bit. But doesn't this look just like that stuff that all those uh, neighbors of uh, James is wearing? Those uh, Duck Dynasty. People? <laughs> is, are my those neighbors. Ones that in, yes, yeah. that's right. They live right next door to me. <laughs> don't they? <laughs> aren't they? Aren't you in like the? General, I don't know where they are. I'm just like they sound southern to me, so therefore they must live close to you. Wow! <laughs> wow! He just, he just insulted a large portion of the American audience. I, I just I think know. it's really funny that Americans always get a bad rap for generalizing things and not knowing right. where you know things are geographically, thing and things like that. And then so, you know, so, here we have multicultural boy here, um, you know. With and on, on where Duck Dynasty gets shot at. That's all right. Don't worry about it. No, no. I think those guys are funny. Uh, they oh, live in the Carolina. Yeah, that's right. Like they're that. my they're my brethren. They're my they're my peeps. Yeah. So, what's the beef? I got I no beef with those truth. guys. I don't watch the show. I don't really understand what the big deal about it is, or why it's entertaining. And people like it. It's a good question. It's not so, my thing, you know. I mean, I'm more of a nerd, you know. I mean, I, I love going out in the woods. I love going outdoors, but I don't camo up and I don't shoot animals. I mean, you know, I eat animals, but I don't shoot them. <laughs> so uh, I actually was uh, talking about this with some friends of mine the other day, the, the whole idea of a, a reality show t- like, you know, one of these shows, except about uh, web developers and web designers and why. Yeah, it'd be the most boring happened. show ever. Well, you can, you know, if you if you had a show you just with imagine like imagine cameras following Jeffrey Zeldman around for twenty four hours. <laughs> God. Well, based on his Facebook updates, I think that'd be quite interesting. But I'm thinking, you know, you need you need someone with a quite interesting personality, and then a lot of, you know, because I I mean, I stumbled on a show the other you. day. That would be you. The the cameras could follow you around. I should have around. a reality show. You could go from like an hour of working on a WordPress theme and and um, cussing out uh, the people at WordPress.com to uh, to going backstage and and playing support guitar at a death metal concert. Ballroom yeah. dancing. Yeah, awesome. the ballroom, ballroom dancing. dancing. Yeah. Making yes. jewelry, I understand. Making jewelry, yeah. right? Yeah. And yep. photo and photo walks. I mean, dude. I mean, yeah. I would be so boring, dude. All I do is like Minecraft and computers. So. You know, all I, all I do is sit at home. I just occasionally <laughs> do other things. But I was thinking, you know, because um, I, I watched this show the other day while I was eating lunch. That was about a, a shop that makes aquariums, and I was like, really, yeah, really, this is a reality good. show about making aquariums. There should be a reality. Did show you watch about the whole thing too? No, they I make just some amazing watched. stuff, dude. I yeah, I, I watched like. Tank, I tank only watched it while there. I was eating, so it was a very like small time I'm slot. I've been aquariums a little bit though. I've had multiple tanks over the years, and uh, and there's a there's an art form, you know, to to doing an aquarium right. You know, that takes oh, a lot. Oh, I'm not I'm not dissing aquariums, or the people in the show. I am questioning whether or not there should be a show like that about web design. Yeah, I think I think it's just that, like you no, said, there should you not be a show it. like that about web design. <laughs> I, I think, think so. Should... Yeah, I think you should find the right. It's like you said, you have to find the right people, because uh, you know not everybody is sort of like as interesting as some of those people. I and mean, we love our favorite show. 
Sorry, I pretty much yeah. show uh, swamp people. You know. <laughs> that's and your favorite I, show. I don't hunt any gators. Like that's me and my Holy wife. Holy moly! Yeah, swamp people. It's awesome. <laughs> you know what my favorite show is? What? Right now, it's the killing. I haven't seen that. I've heard it's good. I've heard it's it's, good. it's it's Nordic noir, man. It's like they well, took have, the Danish... have either of you seen the uh, reality show that's centered around advertising companies called The Pitch? Have you seen that? Yeah, I've seen I've that. I've seen it listed. I've wanted to watch it, but I've never synced up my viewing habits with the time that it's on, um, and I haven't really seen it on like Netflix or anything. But I think you know, the concept is very time. interesting. The concept that you know you follow a couple of advertising agencies as they pitch the same client. Uh, I think it's really interesting because you get some insight on how people brainstorm and how people approach solving a problem. And, of course, you, I'm sure they amp up the drama and the, the, the marketing aspect of it. But that actually it actually is a perfect lead-in to some of the things that I want to talk about today because uh, I just got finished recording a course on prototyping. And yes. as, a, as, you know, as a big part of writing that course, I had to really do an assessment of my own creative process and, you know, what I do when I prototype and when I create things. And, you know, and of course I read a lot of articles about how different people approach it, and I read a lot of, of uh, science behind, you know, brainstorming and some of the things out there. So uh, I want to hear from you guys in terms of your methods, not necessarily prototyping, but just when you're tasked with something that you have to create and you're coming up with something for the very first time, what are some of the things that you do and sit down to come up with new ideas and is it different or does it change if you're collaborating with others? Hmm. That was like there. a very no, narrow go. question. Go. <laughs> Do you want to go first, Ray? Yeah, absolutely. Either way is fine. Wait. Well, then go. Go ahead. I thought, no I thought you said, shall I go, shall no, I go first? Do you want to go first? Oh, yeah, sure. So, you know, I think I usually start with just a lot of research, you know, about what I'm doing, um, looking at competitive, you know, products. Uh, you know, say like last year I put together a bar camp event, so I knew that I had to put together not just the website but the whole plan of how I was going to approach it. Uh, so, you know, the first thing I did is just look at how it was done in other places, looked at their websites, uh, look at the types of sponsors that they have, look at the layout, um, and um, you know, then I usually go into just the process of sort of thinking really that type of website I would just do very simply on, on a browser. You know, when I was at the Sentinel, like, making humongous websites, um, you know, it was more like we would sit down together and talk about what the requirements were. Uh, we already had an established, in that case, you already have, like, an established navigation structure, so you can't really, don't really need to come up with that. It's really a redesign of the existing website. So you're pretty much just taking like all the channels and breaking them down into, okay, we've got a channel that needs to do this, a channel that needs to do that. Here's the type of templates that we have to deal with. You know, we have to have a story template, we have to have a home page, channel template, we have to have navigation. And so you just kind of break everything down into like all the different pieces that you have to attack. And then you just start, you know, prototyping. And at that time I, I use fireworks, you know, to just start laying out, um, you know, sort of roughs of how I wanted to do things. Just um, when you say prototypes, are you building functional prototypes, or are you talking about wireframes? And I think models? you know. It, eventually, they ended up being functional prototypes. So by the time I had to present to somebody, there would be you know essentially a few channels of the look and feel of how I wanted. How early in that process would you create a functional prototype? Is it Pretty, after um, the requirements have been given? After you know, you've done a few rounds of planning and design work. I mean, was it further into the meat of it? Yeah, really, it's at the, at the time when I had to present my thoughts to other people uh, because I would pretty much be working by myself for the most part. On, on Did you ever do project. prototyping for yourself, like you're trying to work through a problem, so you... Oh, yeah, well, you know, I usually start out really, um, when I'm doing things now, I usually start out with a mind map because I'm sort of a mind map type person, so... I, I just that gets me organizing what you know. In contrast to what I was what I was doing then, uh, that makes me have to think about what the requirements and what the different pieces of everything that I have to design are. So whereas before, I think I used to do less of that and more of prototyping functionally. Uh, now I do more of that and less of 
the final prototypes because I'm really my own client. I don't really have to present it necessarily to other people on a lot of projects. So I don't really. I just really design on the browser. Uh, I may throw something into right. you know a, like a rough prototyping tool just to organize my brain as to okay, I know I've got this page that I got to do, and I know it needs these elements. So I need to like figure out how they're gonna be. So on you're creating models. HTML prototypes at this point. You've moved on to doing that. Yeah, I mean, I start with a prototyping tool, um, and then I move on to just HTML prototypes, right? Are like you using any type stuff. of a framework like Bootstrap? Yeah, Bootstrap. bootstrap I, I, you know, I love Bootstrap, so I use that a lot. I know you just love very, Bootstrap. Very, very quick. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Very, very quick. <laughs> now, do you ever use that code as production code, or do oh, you re re build it from the ground up? You do. Absolutely. So yeah, your, your I, prototype becomes a functional website. Do you have trouble maintaining coding standards? Based on that, uh, you know, since I'm using Bootstrap, I mean, it just depends on the site that I'm working on. A lot of the sites that I'm doing are super small. Um, you know, a local like bar camp event, like who cares if it just sits on the whole Bootstrap? So they, framework. they're not really looking at a prototype. Then they're looking at a version of the site that they oh. could. Uh, well, it, I think it morphs into that. Like as I'm developing that, you know, code that is not very doesn't have a style sheet, for example, at the beginning. Yeah. will eventually become the actual product. So I start off with just like the bootstrap framework style, look and feel, just putting the content where it needs to go, even flowing the content where, where it needs to go eventually. Um, but then at, at a certain point, I have to go, okay, I have to style this. And um, because I've laid it out in, in a rough prototyping tool, um, you know, like Balsamic, like I'll start with Balsamic, just to let me know, okay, I know kind of where my things need to go. So then I build it up in Bootstrap just in code, and then I have a framework of that looks black and white, you know, like the Bootstrap styles look. Um, and then I take that and I go into a style, um, you know, a style sheet mode, and I make it look how I how I want it to look. By that time, I think I've gotten to the point where my brain has is already thinking about visually where I want to go with it. And so once I've you know prototyped it with like um, you know a, the rough prototyping tool, then I kind of know where I'm going to be going with it. And it's just a matter of morphing it. So it's more organic, I think, now than, than it used to be. Because before, since I had to have other people approve things, I would make more prototypes before I wrote any code. And then I would show it to, you know, show people like two or three different styles. You right. know, and then I would take that and code it. Now, anywhere along that process, do you ever do any usability testing? Uh, well, it depends. Yeah, no, not really. Not on the small sites that I do now. In yeah. the past, let's say, like say when I was a Tribune, uh, yes, at some point I wouldn't do it, but we were big enough that we would have people do those. Okay. So Lord? at some, you know, and and it's so different because the sites are so humongously big. We're mm -hmm. talking like, I mean, we're talking like, you know, thousands of pages, you know, yeah. many many channels, lots of different things. So, um, you know, it's, this is a, a slightly different process than making something just for yourself or for small gotcha. place. Okay. More so, uh, it, it, it depends <laughs> a bit on it depends a bit on what I'm working on because I'm kind of in the same situation as Ray. It's like either I'm working on personal projects, in which case I have a very kind of wishy-washy way of doing it, or I'm working on something huge. And when I work on something huge, um, it's I kind of have a totally different set of rules. Yeah, it's a different set of rules, and it's because I've over time learned that if you don't do things a certain way, then you'll very quickly run into trouble. So, because you know my my field is WordPress and pretty much everything always defaults there, um, the first thing I do in pretty much any project is set up a you know clean WordPress site and jam in a bunch of content that I know is going to be on the site. Um, and as I'm doing that, I also map out the site in kind of a, it's not a mind map, but it's a um, hierarchical tree that shows like, you know, here's so the like whole page. Map. From the whole page, you have your 15 different things. And then uh, what I do is I say like, okay, so this type of taxonomy or this type of uh, category is going to be handled differently than all the other ones. So that means I need a template for that. And then I actually map out my templates. So I'm not as much of making a site map as I'm making a template map. So like, more of what is it I need to make here? Right? It's, it's, so it's, it's more of a content survey then, in yeah. a way. Yeah, because more often than not, uh, new clients uh, have very little 
understanding of their own content and what should be done with it and how it's handled. Um, I also force the clients to get involved in content production immediately, like right off yeah. the top. I just, if I need a custom post type or something like that, I build that in immediately and then I make them fill in the content because then I can look at it, I can figure out what's going on with that. And then from there, uh, it's usually one of those. If I'm the designer, uh, generally I'll talk to the clients and think a lot and look at things and then I get some crazy idea in my head and it's horrible because it's never like manifested. That's what it's going to look like. It's more like a feeling. I can't describe it any other way. I get a right. feeling. And it's like, that feeling is what I'm trying to somehow make in design. And then I'll make like a hundred sketches and they're all terrible. And then I'll end up <laughs> kind of amalgamating all of these sketches into some sort of rough layout approach. And then I'll make that layout. So I'll actually build a very, very, uh, very um, basic WordPress theme that just boxes everything in the right layout so that, you know, the header goes over here, the menu goes under here, it actually has a drop down on it, the images are always on this side, the text flows this way around, there's a sidebar in some places and not other places. And I actually build out a full WordPress theme and then that becomes the, sta like the starting point. And I guess that would be the prototype because then I build it so in such a really way that... So you're really prototyping with a live WordPress site with the client at that point. Yeah, because then the client can go and click on it. And then I'll say, you know, when, when we in the... Um, discovery state when I said, well, if you're going to do it this way, then we need to have a separate way of handling that kind of information because otherwise it will conflict with this and it's not clear to the people visiting that they are on this part of the site now. It's very hard conceptually to understand it when you talk right. about it, but when you actually build it and people click and they go, oh, where am I now? <laughs> That's right. usually what happens. They go, I don't understand. Is this... Uh, you know, is this a review or is this a uh, blog post or is this a news item? And then I say, yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about. These things are different, so we need to handle them differently. And there has to be like a visual cue for it. Um, right. And it also gives me the opportunity to talk to them about things like keyboard navigation, uh, responsive design, because a lot of the time um, clients will be very reluctant to uh, want to even consider responsive design because right. they have an idea of what the website should be. And they can't quite wrap their heads around this idea that you have no control over the end user and they can access that in any way. So by giving them that and saying, okay, so open that on your phone and you see how now it works and then I'll make some sort of static page just so that they can see what happens when it's not. Um, so I, I've started doing that and I end up designing a lot of it in the browser. Uh, the browser very much dictates the design mm. towards the end. So now, aside from you things, and the client, do you ever do any usability testing? Do you ever bring like the client's target demographic into the mix and have them look at the site? I try to. Yeah. Uh, it's usually really hard because we work under very strong, uh, strict budgets, um, right. and a lot of clients will also be very reluctant to do it because they have their own specific idea about what this should be. I've always um, really found that fascinating, quite frankly, because I run into this exact same kind of, of pushback. I've always found it really interesting that so many clients say, no, 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 I know what my users want. My users yeah. don't know what they want, but I, yeah. I know, I know what they want. I don't I, really, I'm not interested in hearing what they want. I think the best example I have is uh, I built a website for um, uh, a school that uh, you know has a schedule so it's not a school school it's like a school for adults where people go to learn right. stuff right? right and they have a schedule and the old website literally had this insane long um, HTML table this is Phoenix University isn't it something like that <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was literally, uh, one page was the entire schedule for the entire school it had one massive HTML table that was updated wow. once a year right yeah. and it was impossible to find anything. You literally had to open it and then you had to like go control F on your keyboard and search <laughs> for the dates because it was so messy. Ouch. And you know, the different uh, the different table, uh, what do you call it? This is a row, this is a column, column, row. Yes. The horizontal ones, yeah. Yeah, the they rows. would change in size depending on how many courses were currently being offered that week. Right? Nice. So they were all different sizes, nothing was clickable, you couldn't get anywhere. Like when you're halfway down the page, if you were like, oh, I'm interested in that, you had to go back up to the top. So no searching, no sorting, nothing like that. Yeah, it was, it was just total chaos, right? 
<laughs> and then we designed a new site. And uh, early in the process, uh, I introduced this idea of having an active, um, having an active uh, uh, calendar where you could see like the month or just a week or you could see just a day and where each of the items on the calendar would be clickable and would take you to the corresponding course, you know, rational, logical stuff that you would expect from any calendar. Sure. Right? Whereupon, on demonstrating this to the client, I got two pieces of feedback. The first one was, but I can't see everything that's being offered for the whole year. <laughs> to which I said, no person will ever want to see that, but I understand that you think that's a concern. Um, and then the second thing they said was, how are people able to print this out? Oh my god. <laughs> and I was like, how, why would anyone want to print it out? This is a they, they active, probably did. It's yeah. an active calendar that in the, in the old days I, yeah, in the old days I totally had the people that would go, I have to print your website. I got to yes. print it all out. I'm like, really all the 5000 pages like of the Exactly. The paper you got to print it. Like, how, are, how do you even find all of them? Like, at one. Like, and know. and then this and then this person said, "Well, you know, uh, I have a lot of older clients who are used to doing things a certain way, so therefore we can't change it." And I actually had to challenge them and say, "I don't think you understand <laughs> your own clients because right. there's no way in hell anyone is printing this stuff out, right?" Right. And and actually had to like go and talk to them with her there and say. Are you? Do you ever print this out? And they go, no, we never use it because it gives us no information, right? Like the original calendar. Sure. Um, and it got to the point where the client just flat out would not accept that this was how the calendar was going to be. And yeah. I had to make a deal that was, we'll try the calendar for like three months. And if anyone complains, then we'll make changes. If everyone complains, then we'll go back to the old way. And I think in total we got one complaint, and the complaint was, was something her. like, <laughs> Where that person? when I got into the calendar <laughs> it was showing the month of June, and I wanted to see the month of July, <laughs> and I couldn't and I don't understand why it's not showing, because they had gone in on like June 30th or something like that. Of course. And I'm like, yeah. So the big ass button at the top that says July on it, you never considered clicking on it. Like <laughs> there's a huge button at the top that says July. Some people you can't say another one that says that. May. <laughs> like well, how do you, you function know, in modern society if you can't click on things? <laughs> yeah. When when you do a course, you know, the, one of the interesting things, one of the things I love about being an author um, is that as you do a course, it's a learning process for you too. You know, every time you do a course, you pick up new skills and you learn new things and you you challenge your assumptions. And one of the things that I've really decided to try to change the next time I work, you know, as I was working through my process, I realized that any testing or prototyping that I was doing was happening very late in the game. It was happening at a stage where you know you'd had several client meetings, you'd have several you know discussions, you've already had mock-ups, you've already had wireframes, you've planned out all this stuff. So by the time I was creating a prototype, I was really just showing the functioning aspect of what we'd already talked about. Right. And that totally was not allowing for any type of generative or discoverative type prototypes. You know, really the prototype was just reinforcing what we'd already talked about. Mm. And I'm going to actively try in my next project to start prototyping really early in the process. Because one of the things that, uh, you know, for this course I took a, a fictitious application, you know, that I was building and just started working on it. And it's amazing because I prototyped it very, very early. You know, with no assumptions about what it was going to be other than a vague requirements document. Uh -huh. And the innovations that came out of it, in terms of how I would approach it, um, really, really, really kind of surprised me. You know, I took it in directions that I didn't think I would go with it, simply because I started prototyping it and showing it to people and having people play around with it. And I think too often we either relegate the end user to somebody that just needs to consume something the way we tell them to consume it, or we just ignore the fact that they probably have some good ideas to share with us about our products. And that's the hard thing to convince a client, more than like you're talking about, that, hey, the people that are going to be using this, you really should involve them early on. If you can get them involved in the prototyping process early, then they 
help you design the application that they're going to be consuming. And I think, um, that's something I'm going to change. Yeah, I, I think one of the really big challenges, especially if you're working on a project where there's an existing thing and you're mm, updating yeah. it, is that um, not only is the owner of the site really invested in how it used to be and has a very hard time like saying, okay, let's just start fresh. But more yeah. importantly, the owner of the site usually has um, a very strong belief that any kind of change that fundamentally changes the behavior of the site will lead to people abandoning the site. Right. Uh, because they'll, they'll come in and they'll be like, this is completely new and completely different. I don't understand. I'm leaving right now. And that can and be it's strange, Yeah, but it's a strange attitude to have, though, because if you think it about it, it is. It, 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 like, it is in how many that, cases it? does this actually happen? Like, it happens if you have um, a fast food restaurant and then you rebrand it as, uh, or change everything into an extremely expensive French restaurant. That would turn people away, right? But if you're simply changing the layout of your restaurant to make it more accessible, yeah, and make it more understandable and make it look less like it was built in 1952. <laughs> But no one's you know, think, go, about, oh think about God, Facebook. Every time I'm Facebook makes a change, you know, everybody just blows. Oh my God! They'll never use yeah, Facebook. Yeah. Well, of course, they all use it, and uh, you know, they all continue to use it. And then after a while, everybody goes, "Oh yeah, I like this." I and love. I, remember, I love. Some of my friends did that a couple of times, where they would actually be like. Facebook has changed. Screw this! I'm deleting my profile, <laughs> and they actually delete their profile, and then like. A month later, they're back under a yeah. new name because they've deleted their profile completely, and they're like, "Hey guys, what's up?" It's me. <laughs> back. And I'm like, "What? What this happened? Timeline Why thing is so bad." <laughs> yeah. Like, well, and, and and that's that, that's a big difference when you're working on a, an existing product and you're updating it or changing it. It's a totally different set of requirements than mm -hmm. when you're building something from the ground up. You know, um, have you guys ever done any like A/B testing? With existing products to you know like I have not, no. changes. No, you know, I, I, I haven't. Yeah. I wish I did a couple of times. Yeah. But again, it's hard because that requires funding. It requires yes, it people. It requires all these things, and usually it requires a lot of people that get it. And you know, you're dealing with people that want to print the whole website. You know, <laughs> it's like that concept of be. So it's funny testing? because both of you, your answer to that, both of you was, I wish I had better clients. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I love my clients. They're great people, and 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 they're yeah. actually the projects are super interesting because they're so challenging. Because like, because it brings me into these situations where I have to explain things like I had a you know this ongoing project that I'm working on that keeps bringing up new things again and again. Like I, uh, it has a designer on board who's doing the information architecture and the UX and then it has me who's solely doing development and very early in the process I said you know chances are uh, things weird things are gonna happen when we get into the development of this because there's a lot of information that has to be parsed in a certain way and you'll see when we get into it that you know this really needs to be addressed up front and it wasn't and it got to the point this week where we actually got pretty close to finalizing a lot of the designs and everything has now been sent back to the drawing stage. Mm. Because as I was developing it, I was like, well, what happens when you do a search for this? Then you're getting two completely different sets of data and they're not separated properly and you can't filter both at the same time because that's super confusing to people. And it wasn't until it actually got like laid right. out in front of everyone and I was like, look what happens. I click on this button and then you get these two things and there's no clear separation between them. You don't really see what's going on. This is going to be super confusing. And then, you know, the, the owner of the site finally realized, oh, that's what he was talking about three months yeah. ago, right? And, yeah, and that requires to rethink. If you had been able to yeah. prototype and work at the same time with the UX designer and a few other people, that all of that probably could have been avoided. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it's really just about changing workflows. And I think that any time that you're in a team environment like that, when you can do collaborative work, then that is, that's awesome. I mean, one of the things I did... Um, because I did a lot of paper prototyping, and I'm a huge fan. You mentioned sketching earlier. I'm a huge fan of sketching because anybody can do it. You can have your client, you can have testers in, you can have marketing people. You can anybody can sketch, and you know if you can get all the stakeholders involved in at least that preliminary round of designing and testing, then it's going to make 
not only for a stronger product, but it's going to avoid the things like you were talking about just yeah. there, where it's like they all handed it to you, and you're like, oh, this isn't going to work. Yeah, <laughs> and know? it's also it's also really important to have the developers in that conversation because yes. a developer like me will tell you, you know, uh, it, you can make it look any way you want, but at the end of the day, there's data coming in, and that data has to be managed in a certain way. It has to be filtered in a certain way. It has to be displayed in a certain way, and uh, that's why I say, like, when I start projects on my own, I always start with a template hierarchy, because that way I can early on say, okay, so here are all these different scenarios. Like, I'm basically tracking the user. It's like, when the user comes in, how many different things can the user do, and how does the right. user end up in certain places, right? So I basically start at the top, and then I start at the very bottom. I say, like, this is the end result. Here are whatever it is, like a, a movie review or a, a car or, you know, a, a dress or whatever it is that is the main feature, right? And I say, so from here, how many different methods can you take to get to that point? You can either do a search, you can go through a taxonomy, you can go from the front page, and then, and then you can come from one product and then jump back to a taxonomy and then back into another product and actually map all the lines and try to figure out every conceivable method for coming to different places because that way I can see, like, okay, so... And more, now I got to interrupt something. you right there. That's yeah. one of the reasons why you're so good at what you do. There are so few people that actually do that. It sounds, what you're just talking about, sounds like common sense, but amazingly enough, there are, I know a ton of people that design websites that never even consider what you just said about how many ways are there for me to get to here and which way is the user most likely to want to use and how do I make it easier for them to do that. Very few that's, people actually think like that. But that's what we actually do. Like that, I keep saying that when I talk <laughs> to designers and developers. Like We don't design websites. We design methods for people to find the information they're looking for. Like if you don't make, you can make a website that looks like a million bucks, but if the person who lands on it can't find what they're looking for, then you just did everyone a disservice. And right. you're not actually, you know, I don't care what it looks like. It can look like crap as long as the user is able to find it. Well, I care and what it looks like, like, but I'm a visual designer. That's yeah, but like, I mean, you know, I, it, it you can know, look I great and be terrible. You mentioned right? like a University of Phoenix, like most university websites are the absolute worst at yeah. that type of thing. Like, you know, I was... I was trying to sign up for a class at a school, and uh, for the love of me, like I could not find the course. Like I tried, okay, I have the course, I the course ID and the course name, and so there's a search box. You put the course name, and it you hit find, and it can't find it, and you're like, okay, now let me try with the with the school of, and you're like, okay, this is a writing course. Is it in the school of English, the writing school, the school of business development? Is it in my school because I'm taking it? under this school and, and it's just just like crazy. You, you put in the, the, the ID which you were surely if I put the ID number of the thing <laughs> it will find it. No. And, and it's like really what the heck happened here? Like you know people forget how Google revolutionized the industry just by having a simple one box search thing with works. you know one or two buttons that, that finds things. Uh, yeah. You know holy cow. I mean those search boxes on universities are just crazy. And, uh, well, it's because oh. no one ever thought of what I just said. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, how, do, how do you find? Yeah. What are they looking for, and and how do you find it, and how do you make it easy for them? Because yeah, you really, when you go to a university website, you really have to dig in, spend. It's the probably the worst usability cases. I mean, that, I think that would be a fun sort of thing to like redesign a university website. You know, to yeah. uh, make it. Easy to find, easy to oh, work yes, with. Oh, yes, it would be fun in theory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. That's also a massive theory. amount of data, just a massive project because there's so many different schools. There's so many different sections. You know, there's like internal sections, student, you know, grade reporting. There's just all these different parts to it. So, yeah. So, on the topic of um, making things uh, look good and be easy to uh, access, uh, did you guys see the new uh, data.gov website? No, I haven't seen it. That's that the kind of the, stuff I stay away from. That the White House just uh, released? It's actually really neat. Uh, let me share it with you. So, um, you know, as part of the current president's uh, plan of action, he said that he wanted to release more data to people in a way that they can parse, right? So there's a website called uh, data.gov, um, which is 
an old website where that has all this government data, like information about everything, like statistics, basically. There's tons of statistics, and I'm a big statistics geek. Is this where and, I can find, like, what sites James has been going to? <laughs> yes, this is the uh, NSA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's basically it has information about all these things, but the old website, you know, looked like an old website. So uh, if I go back here, like this is what the old website looks like, right? It's it's a standard website, but now they're moving on to this new. Ray, thing are you seeing they're... anything? Because uh, oh. yeah, I see it. I see something now. Yeah. Okay. All right. I had I had your placeholder there for a second. Yeah, I'm just oh, seeing yeah. my face too. It's very odd. Yeah. That's not cool. Like is that the old yeah. Okay, so the old this, is, website? this is the old website. So the new website, um, let's see if I can find it again. There it is. Uh, it's called next. Uh, next, dot, okay. Next dot data dot gov, and it just attempts to give you all the information that you're looking for. Like if you want to go look at education, it breaks down oh, all Jesus the different. Oh Jesus God! They copied Pinterest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and this is you know it's responsive, it's masonry. It's WordPress, you know, yeah. all the good wow. things in life. Um, <laughs> but uh, did they I really use Mastery? I, I'm assuming they did. Yeah, Let's they probably did. Let's take a look and see what this is. <laughs> I'm guessing uh, they did. So this is this is Morton on the internet. Ninety yeah. percent of the time is looking at other people's code. Masonry, yep. right there. Yep, sure enough. They did. I personally use Isotope. Because mm -hmm. Isotope gives you filtering capabilities Masonry could dream of. But that's just me. Um, what have you been reading on Reddit? I see that tab's open up there. Yeah, so, <laughs> so the really cool thing about this, I'll show you that in a second. But the really okay. cool thing about this is where do they want you to comment on it? This website, the government data website, yeah. give us feedback on Twitter or Quora, or you can go to GitHub and collaborate. Wow. Yeah. yeah, this is a That's strong. US government website that is now powered by open source, using open source to you know get people to collaborate, and they actively are looking for things. So, so you know, when type I type in, type, there, gonna... what, type in what web websites has Ray been visiting and see if see, see <laughs> N S A. <laughs> oh gosh! Sorry. You're, no now you're on the list. Shocking. Yeah. Oh, there's a shock. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's. It, I think this is really neat because it shows kind of the... Um, it is uh, kind of cool. A completely new approach to this. And it's. Uh, it also shows interesting data. I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but this um, graph thing that's happening at the very top of the page yeah. is actually live visualization of earthquake data from the U.S. Geological Survey. Oh, very so, nice. You know. And and I think what this is kind of the whole open data approach. Like a lot of governments around the world are doing this. They're releasing open data in such a way that people can take it and then use it for things. I mean, there's a there's um, Vancouver, the city I live very close to. Uh, they released open data on all their government properties, and one of the things that is in that is actually um, they have geolocated everything in the entire city of Vancouver, including how far from the curb a tree is positioned. So you can actually find the geolocation for any tree in Vancouver. And some geeky students actually made a driving game where you can drive around, a ca drive a cab in Vancouver, and then you'll actually see like every single tree and every single uh, manhole and every everything is there based on this open data. This is wrong. This is the kind of stuff that my wife would go like, why don't they just go look at the trees, man? So <laughs> drive around town. You know, yeah, but it's useful. You can make a yeah, game out of because it. Because if you're, let, let's say you're buying a house, you can actually go into this data set and find out what's there, right? And you can see, yes. like, on the data set, it says that there's a tree there, but I can't see the tree in the photo. And it turns out the real the realtor went in and, like, edited out the tree that's right in front of your house because stuff the like fiend. that happens. So I just thought that that was neat. And it's, you know, very impressive. And it's WordPress. Um, which brings me to what I wanted to talk about today. Uh-oh. Which uh, I'm just going back in my tabs here. Um, so uh, I have some... Can WordPress again? Possibly. Uh -oh. <laughs> I have some potentially good news, uh, hopefully. Um, as uh, everyone who's been following WordPress knows, uh, WordPress version 3.6, who was originally scheduled to be released in April, uh, and then in May, and then in June, and then in <laughs> July, is still not out. Um, but the... the um, 
uh, 3.6 release candidate was released earlier this week. Now, uh, for those of you who have been playing along since the beginning, you'll know that the release candidate version 2 of 3.6 was also released in June and then promptly pulled because, or sorry, in May it was promptly pulled because of issues. Anyway, now the development process, which you see here, technically should have finished May 20th, um, has gotten to a point where we now have a new release candidate that actually works. Uh, it works quite well. And uh, chances are this will be released, I'm going to guess, next week. And the reason why I'm guessing next week is because next week on f uh, Friday and Saturday is WordCamp San Francisco. And it would, quite frankly, be embarrassing if they didn't have this version out by then. So I'm guessing it will be released on, like, Wednesday next week. Um, the new version has uh, some interesting new features. Most of the big stuff that they were going to change has been taken out. So it's actually just like a little bit of an update. The biggest thing is that if you go to menus, you'll see that the menu structure has been changed. So that it's supposedly easier to work with. It has like tabbed panels instead of, or accordion panels instead of all these things that go down. And uh, there's some neat stuff going on with the um, revision editor. Uh, so if you go to a post that's been revised a lot, uh, see if I can find something here. Uh, like if I go into a post here that has a lot of revisions and I go down to the bottom, you can actually like compare your revisions against each other, which is quite neat. So you can like that's go cool. in here and say compare two revisions. Heavy. Yeah. And you can actually see the two next to one another. You see, I do a lot of cutting and pasting in my articles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, this is the major stuff that's coming in this release. So it's you know, getting there. Hopefully we'll have the version. Uh, one really neat thing that came out this week was that the, um, the Walking Dead Story Sync app was nominated for an Emmy. And the Walking Dead Story Sync app is powered by WordPress. So, you know, for all the naysayers who say WordPress is just a blogging platform, uh, I have a two words for you. Get off <laughs> your <laughs> stupid horse. <laughs> James just okay. dropped that. It's like, yeah, it's James, like, I'm offended, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what, so what are your thoughts on Ghost? And let people know what that is, actually. Ghosts, yes. Ghosts is uh, the Kickstarter new blogging platform that's supposed to uh, maybe revolutionize or change or uh, take over, yeah, so, I guess. Uh, I am going to say uh, Ghosts just, is what just welcome happened? back. What just happened? Welcome I don't know. Back. We, thought, we thought you got offended about WordPress and Morton's take on the on the platform. It's so. not a blogging platform. And then yeah. that's the last thing I... <laughs> I woke up in a you know in a hotel room in Bangkok. <laughs> Weird, my liver. Uh, where's my so, liver? So Ray was asking what I think about Ghost. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Ghost was a Kickstarter project. So yeah. it's a crowd crowd funded project. It was started by uh, John O. Nolan. Uh, it was actually really interesting how this came about because John uh, uh, John originally uh, said that he wanted to fork WordPress and make it into a blogging platform again because WordPress has become a content management system and there's a lot of debate internally in the community whether that's a good thing or not. And he wanted to make something that's super simple and easy to blog with. And he went on Kickstarter and I think he asked for, yeah, he asked for 25,000 pounds and he ended up getting 196,000 pounds instead, you know, so. Wow. That's not, that's not unimpressive, I'm going to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, this is going to be uh, open source, just like uh, WordPress is, but it's mainly going to be a blogging platform. Like, so it's, it doesn't have the content management capabilities of uh, WordPress, and it's meant to not have them. And the idea here is it will not evolve into content management. It will continue to be a blogging platform that's just super easy to use. Um, you have to, to try it. You have to actually like get in touch with them and everything. But I think that this is a really interesting uh, move because Ghost isn't the only one. You also have like Medium, you have a whole bunch of these new blogging only platforms. And it's funny because most of them are populated by developers who came from WordPress who get frustrated with the um, CMS thing and then they say, no, I want to just blog. And yeah. I, I, I truly think there is a place for that, uh, I mean, that article that I was showing you the revisions of, 
is a super inflammatory article I wrote about how WordPress needs to be needs to be split up into sections so that we have a blogging version of WordPress, we have a content management version of WordPress, we have a multi-site version of WordPress instead of having all of it in one box. Um, and uh, I think that... Would you support making them modules that you could tack on? Yeah, that's what I want them to do. Yeah. I actually want to have like WordPress core, which is just like stripped down. This is the functional version of WordPress, but it doesn't really display anything. And then you tack on whatever module you want. So you get either the blogging module, and then you just get the blogging features and none of the other crap. Or you get the CMS module that gives you all the CMS stuff um, and, and the blogging stuff. And then you can have your multi-site version, which is scaled for multi-site. And then you have your... Uh, like, you know, you have your different, you have an enterprise solution for enterprise that has tighter security. Um, this is the rational way it should be done instead of trying to cram it all into one solution because what's what I see as... It gets a little bloated. Yeah, as, a, as an educator, what I see is that new users of WordPress are continuously getting more and more confused. Um, and the reason why WordPress 3.6 was held up uh, was because they had introduced a new feature in 3.6 that was very blogger-centric, but was so confusing that even people who are experienced in using WordPress could not understand what the hell that thing was doing. Um, and I even showed it here. It was that post feature, uh, the post uh, template thing where you had like the video button and the image button at the top. And if you click on it, you're not actually adding an image or a video. You're just like saying it was very weird. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, right. I remember you talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of strangeness going on. You know, it's open source, so people can do whatever they want. But the discussion that came out of my article about uh, what should be happening to WordPress was really interesting because I basically saw a schism in the community. It's like half of it says, "What we're doing now is the right thing to do. Shut up." The other half said. We are going in the in a horrible direction here. This needs to be dealt with immediately. And it looks like Goldstone and these other spin-off projects are falling squarely on that side. They're saying that we're now building one of those, uh, what do you call it? Uh, jack of all trades, master of none kind of things. Yeah, right. And I, I honestly think that if it continues down that route, we Some might... Some people refer to that as Photoshop. Yes. <laughs> I think in somewhere down the road, something else is going to come along and take WordPress's place as the leader of the pack because of the fragmentation that's happening in the wow. app. So. Yeah. So do you, really, do you think we really need a better blogging platform and not just a better CMS, like a core? Like, I, I think a core CMS, um, that, like you said, like you can maybe module, tack modules onto, it makes a lot more sense to me. But I, I don't know that WordPress can the other way around. That. You know, I look for a CMS, and then if it needs a blogging module, you know, I look for one that has one that I can tack onto it, you yeah. know? So I kind of well, approach it from the other way. The, the problem with WordPress is that it is a bloated blogging platform, right? It, it, yeah. If you look in the core, you'll see that it's still sitting as a blogging platform. Everything you do in WordPress is a post. It's, it's insane. It's like, yeah. anything right. you do in WordPress is a post. Every new post you make is a post. Every image you add to WordPress is a separate post. Every comment you make is a separate post. Every menu item you make is a separate post. Every revision of anything in WordPress is a post. Every page is a post. Every custom post type is a post. Every, every taxonomy name is a post. Every tag is a post. Everything is a post. Yes. So it's not a very scalable solution. It's a very like single-minded solution that has a bunch of weird ways of taking that single-mindedness and making it work in different ways. And, you know, one of the things I argued for in my article is we need to draw a line and say, okay, so this is where we redevelop it from scratch. And then we redevelop it in a completely different way that's more agile, that actually addresses what the, what the community wants um, and start fresh. We get rid of all the crush, we get rid of all the old legacy code that makes no sense. And the concern is always that, like, one of the big things with WordPress is it always is supposed to be backwards compatible. And if you do something like this, it won't be backwards compatible anymore. And I think that's fine because that's how everything else is done. And the reality is at some point you need to draw a line and say, you know, this was a great little project, now we need to make it serious. Because, I mean, when the government of the United States is putting out their big data platform on WordPress, we're not playing around here. This is serious stuff, mm -hmm. right? And that means we need to have proper security in place. We need to make it in such a way that it actually works for what people want. And we need to make it in such a way that the people who are managing the government website won't suddenly, through an update, get a bunch of new features they don't want. 
and that will actually infringe on what they're trying to do. And that's precisely what's happening right now. Or could have happened, except it didn't because too many people complained. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> right. Rant yeah, maybe... over. <laughs> yeah. That was a long rant. It was yeah, good. He was very, yeah, I was very excited about it. Yeah, Ray, what's the news on uh, on uh, Bootstrap uh, 3, dude? What's the... So I'm very... I'm very <laughs> you read my mind. I'm very glad you asked. Um, so the latest news is we just had a very weird post on the Bootstrap blog from Fat, who is one of the main uh, developers for Bootstrap, uh, that says Annie Up. And uh, it's a video... That's the entire post? This is the post, Annie Up, right? And if you play this, this is like a rap video from Sesame Street. Can't hear a thing. <laughs> uh, there's no sound, but... Oh, sorry. We get the Anyways, idea. Yeah, you get the idea. You can, you can play it if you want to, but... Well, I've heard look, it. If you look very carefully, this is the interesting part right here. And, and it just says, Annie Up, August 19th. So the thought pattern is that WordPress 3 will be launching in a month. Bootstrap. Bootstrap, I'm sorry. Bootstrap 3 will be launching in a month, August 19th, which I really hope it, it does happen because I'm super ready for it. Um, you know, it's uh, it's really different. So I've, I've played around with it quite a bit. Um, and every, what I hope people do not do is just take the new version of WordPress and install it in their old website. You mean Bootstrap. Aaron, what I'm saying, WordPress, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> what I hope people don't do is just take the new Bootstrap and install it in, the, sorry, in the, take the old version, an old version of Bootstrap website and put the new code for Bootstrap 3 on it because it'll completely break. Um, oh, no every, backwards compatibility. Abs absolutely not. I mean, they changed every class to some other Good name. Word. So when you, when you do it, the whole, the whole thing breaks immediately. Um, you know, the way you do scaffolding, like the way you do the columns is different. The way you... Sounds excellent. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... I think they tried to clean it up quite a bit, and they have been successful, but, you know, just please don't take your old websites and put the new code in them before you, you know, read up on what you're supposed to do. That just sounds like a recipe for bootstrap hating on Reddit. It, it, it could be. Um, yeah, so uh, this... Well, you know, Foundation just released a, a new... I mean, Azure released a new uh, version of Foundation that had some really significant changes in it. And, um, you know, I think any time that you have a framework like that, if you're going to be working with a version of that framework, you know, you have to go into it with your eyes. If you want to keep that current, you are going to be faced with a, you know, with maybe a process of, of refractoring everything, you know, from the ground up, um, if you want to join the new one. Yeah, so, you know, it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with Bootstrap 2. It'll still work just fine. There's no reason to update unless you want the new features of 3. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, so there aren't any, per se, there's only, like, two very small new features in the new I'm Bootstrap. still not really seeing Ray's, I'm just seeing Ray's picture. Is that oh, what I see mean? it? You see so it? Okay. So this is this is as a long website. As I see it, it's fine. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. As long as you're seeing it recording. Well, it, it gets fine. recorded if I, I see it. If I don't see yeah, it, do it's not recorded. Right. So um, this is a it's website. Seattle. I've been there. Right. This is a website I did on, with the Bootstrap three engine, and the first thing you'll notice about it is that it is. Rue Academy is not in Seattle. It's in New I know. I, I put it in Seattle for my project. Sorry. You should not have done that. No, actually, this is a conference. <laughs> this is a conference they're having in Seattle, but you know, it's not a real company, so whatever. All right, whatever. Anyways, so real um, to me. The um, <laughs> the first thing you notice is that it's flat. It, it went to flat design. All the gradients are gone in the Bootstrap three version, and really? everything that used to be um, images that were part of a big PNG have been replaced with fonts. So the carousel, this is the carousel, these arrows right here are actually coming in from a font instead okay. of from PNG. So they're using icon fonts. Exactly, icon fonts, exactly, instead of yeah. what, they, what they used to be, just a bunch of PNGs. Which means the nice thing is that these can be now any color you want Yeah. because right. uh, they're no longer just black or white. So that's nice. Um, they can only be one color. 
Yeah, yes, I guess. Yeah. Yes. So the other thing like that you'll notice is the reason why stuff breaks is because they've modified all of their classes in place. So that now everything a column you created with these C O L L G eight. Before the columns used to be named span eight, and that was a horrible, mm -hmm. horrible name because span means something and yeah. it's not a new column. So now they fixed it so that it's now C O L, you know, L G A. But of course, if you have a website that was using the old classes, that it totally breaks everything, like I said. And so things like things that you want to hide on small devices, it used to, the classes for that used to be hidden iPhone, mm -hmm. I think it was, or hidden hidden phone. And now it's hidden SM for small, which makes a lot more sense. But again, it means that whatever you had in the old version of Bootstrap will immediately break. So, um, so you just have to watch like, out. Uh, this should be able to be fixable through search replace, right? I was going to say, that's nothing a good find and replace can't fix. You're right. It's, it's not hard. And they, the changes that they make made make a lot of sense. Um, there's changes like that. So um, once you do a good find and replace, most of your site will be coming back. All the JavaScript works well without any changes, so none of the stuff will really break. It's, it's just that all your classes are called something else now. So you just really have to go through and clean everything up. Um, and uh, there are a couple of very minor new features that essentially bring some of the things, some of the styles from um, something like jQuery Mobile. Um, you know, like Buttons can be the whole width of the device and stuff like that. So very few features, um, but other than that, like you can see the same type of things. Uh, we've got the accordions that they have that are pretty cool um, that work exactly the same way. You just have to watch your classes. Um, you have these tabs that you had before. They're just they're called something else now. And you had uh, something like the um, scroll spy, which is this right here. And um, still works again, but everything is a different class. So you just really have to watch for every place where um, you've used classes, now it just needs to be updated to the new version, so which is looking, not, not bad. Looking at your code uh -huh, reminded me why I don't use frameworks. Frameworks. <laughs> and um, what is it? So, uh, James. Yeah, man. Uh, the, I don't like frameworks because they have things like main call, call LG8. Come on, man. You know my opinion on this. I don't. I think I, you told me, but I'm not I forgot. a fan. I'm not a I'm not a fan of them. All, right? the, yeah, you know the thing is, I, I I'll I'll say this: if I was having to crank out four websites a month, I would use frameworks. Um, but based on the work that I do and the way that I create it, a framework isn't going to give me anything that I can't do myself in a leaner, more semantically correct way. Um, I like the. I like the. I mean, I'll be honest with you. When I, I when I I did a, a title on on frameworks um, not too long ago, and I used Foundation pretty heavily for it. And um, you know, I learned to like it because it was so quick. Once you got used to it, it was so quick to put stuff together. But after a while, I, you know, I quit worrying about how bad my code was. It's not a big deal. I mean, like, if, if the thing that bothers you is that you've got a couple of classes here, um, the fact that you get all this functionality from just adding a few classes, I mean, really, you know, I've got the sidebar here with the... But, Ray, is that really something you couldn't write yourself? The whole framework? I mean, the functionality... No, no not just the framework, but, oh, gosh, I have a, a sidebar that, you know, is responsive. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, to me, like, the payoff of being able to do things super quickly and well and play around with the layouts, like, a lot of times I'll prototype on Bootstrap because it's just so easy for me to make well, a column, you know, it's all, like the styles are already there for me to make the scaffolding. I had a stuff. post on, I, 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 I had a little tweet the other day about this. I was thinking about this, and I just tweeted it out there, and it actually got a lot of responses. You know, one of the books that really influenced me as a designer was Jeffrey Zeldman's Designing with Web Standards. I read that years ago, and it really changed me as a designer. It changed the way that I designed websites. In it, he really railed against what he called classitis, which was 
you know, styling everything with classes, you know, because all of a sudden your code just becomes peppered with this needless classes that don't mean anything and make the code hard to update and maintain. And, you know, I really took that to, to heart. And the tweet I wrote was, you know, 10 years ago, because this is the 10th anniversary of that book, it said 10 years ago, Zeldman told us not to style everything with classes, not to put a bunch of classes in our code. And we nodded solemnly and said, yes, he's right, and then went and did it anyway, because yeah. that's exactly where we are right now. And then yeah. you use something like um, like uh, uh, isotope that filters based on classes. Yeah. And so for everything you want to filter an item by, you have to add a class name. So the current website I'm working on, the, I was in a position where at one point I had one item that had 20 class names on it. And <laughs> I was like, Jeez. we cannot filter like this. I need to find a better method for filtering than using classes because yeah. this is just. And insane. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not uh, without guilt myself. I use a modernizer, you know, all the time, and modernizer loves to throw classes on things, but it does it in a way where the classes are all thrown in the body, and you know, you can you can filter from there. But yeah, so you know, so so I'm not I'm not certainly without guilt myself, and I don't think there's anything wrong with using a framework um, from a performance standpoint. It adds a little weight. Um, so it's really a personal decision. Oh yeah, um, no, I, I agree with you. I, I'm, yeah. I have. I, I don't want to come across as like I'm anti-framework. I no, don't, I'm, just, I'm glad. I personally I'm glad. don't use them. I'm like a code masochist. I like to write everything by hand. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm that. I'm with you on that. Sorry, I'm glad that Morton appreciates frameworks because if you think about it, what is WordPress? Isn't it the biggest framework like in the world? Content management system. Doesn't it add a bunch of classes to everything? And all kinds of other turn crap. That oh, here we go. That's what I do. <laughs> I turn it all off. You well, start I, with I, I could do the same thing. Yeah. I could do the same thing. I mean, I'm just. This is a quick way for me to, yeah. you know, develop websites. And this is why one, WordPress is so big, and two, why Bootstrap is so big. They're both. And the Bootstrap easy. theme <laughs> for WordPress is so popular. Oh, sure. that's that's Because that's right. not my clustering things on top of one another at all. <laughs> so I know I know we're 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 almost at time, and there's yeah. there's there is one more thing that I wanted to get out there. Um, next week I'm actually speaking at two conferences, which is pretty wild. Awesome. I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be speaking at the Breaking Development Conference in San Diego. Uh, I'll be speaking on Flexbox, and then uh, that's on Monday. And then on Tuesday, I'll be speaking on the online CSS Summit conference. Mm -hmm. And I want to reward the listeners or the observers of authored content. If you have watched authored content all the way through, um, and, uh, and, and you hear this, if you tweet to me, uh, and you see my Twitter handle there, at James Will Webb, and mention authored content, the first viewer that tweets to me about the CSS Summit, I have a free pass that you can use for the day. Very nice. Very so, nice. Uh, I want to reward the author, guys. I waited to the very end of the show because you got to watch Very all good. the way through it. But uh, I feel, you know, if, if, if there is somebody out there who will actually suffer through the three of us <laughs> sitting together and talking about web design, they deserve a free conference pass. So, and this is the we, online one, right? That you yeah, can yeah, this is the, yeah, this is the online CSS Summit. And if you look at the, the, the people speaking, uh, just you know, go online and, and, or Google out CSS Summit. I'll, I'll give Morton, I'll give you a link for it. But go online and look at the, uh, the people speaking at this thing, and it's, it's really incredible. It's quite, it's quite the conference. Even That's online. very cool. That's Let's see if you get any tweets out of that. What do people yeah. have to do? I'm sorry again. They just just tweet to me. Just say, hey James, I, I want that that uh, pass to CSS Summit. The first the first viewer that tweets that to me um, gets it. So awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, on that note, uh, I'm not going to be able to do author content next week. Oh. I'm at WordCamp in San Francisco, and I'll be <laughs> attending sessions. Oh my man! We have a good guest also scheduled. So. Actually, and I think it's James's one of James's friends. So maybe uh, James Deke? can. Well, no, well, no, Deke? no. Um, Deke, oh, oh, you're talking about Chris Georginus. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Chris Georginus is going to be here. Um, well, Morton, you'll have to you'll have to let either Ray or me organize it and put it together, and we'll we'll do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Deke Cullen was supposed to be here today, but he got sick, so uh, we will reschedule Deke for a later episode. Bring Deke back at some other time. But uh, yeah, I'll. Uh, so author content next week will be powered by either Ray or James, or both of us, or yep. both of you. Yes, because if you have two parallel hangouts at the same time, 
Well, I can tell you this. I'm going to be flying to San Diego on Sunday, and I'll be flying back on Thursday. So my, my money's on Ray putting it together. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll liaise well, with that, Ray. Just me and Chris. Yeah, you really got to hand – give, really give Ray the that. keys. Give Ray the keys on the way out so he can unlock the uh, I'll, I'll uh, I'll uh we'll we'll see how that pans out. I might actually be able yeah. to drop in, but I can't like I can't uh run it because I'll sure. probably be at the conference in the session or something. So Okay. Cool. All right. Well that is full time for author content. Uh thank you all for watching. Uh there will be something happening next week, I'm sure. Uh but it won't be on my channel, so we'll have to figure that out. Um but Anyway, we'll see you next week and then the week after and the week after and the week after. So oh, don't make same <laughs> same bad time, same bad channel. Bye kids. <laughs>